Good evening. Good evening and welcome to all of you. Uh, we're so glad that you could join us for this very important conversation on care and the close of life. I'm Ed Hilton and I'm the Executive Vice President for Health Sciences at Georgetown University Medical Center. As I think you know, this is the sixth in the Conversations in Bioethics series held annually to engage faculty, staff, and students in the metropolitan DC area and across different disciplines to examine crucial bioethics issues. The Kennedy Institute of Ethics has been at the forefront of discussing critical biomedical issues for over four decades since its founding in 1971. The topic of care and the close of life has engaged many disciplines as it should. Physicians, nurses, philosophers, theologians, sociologists, psychologists, artists, and poets. It's a long list, but all engaged. And of course, all of us in our own personal journeys with family and friends. Reflecting on and discussing issues like this are a natural fit for Georgetown. And the conversation, of course, benefits from Georgetown's strengths, especially our focus on care of the whole person, body, mind, and spirit. Our moderator for this evening's program is Dr. Daniel Solmacy. Dan is someone who, uh, for whom both theoretical and empirical explorations of ethical issues at the end of life have been central to his career as a physician and a philosopher ethicist. He was trained and educated in medicine at Cornell and Johns Hopkins and in philosophy and ethics, of course, here at Georgetown. He serves as acting director of the Kennedy Institute of Ethics and also holds a joint appointment at the uh, Pellegrino Center for Clinical Bioethics at the Medical Center. Dr. Somacy is the inaugural Andre Helliger's Professor of Biomedical Ethics with co-appointments in the Departments of Philosophy and Medicine at Georgetown. Then also continues to see patients and supervise the care delivered by our resident, residents and students in the Department of Internal Medicine. I'm not sure uh, how, how much time he has for anything else, but he's a very busy gentleman. His empirical studies have explored topics such as decision-making by surrogates on behalf of patients who are nearing death. His theoretical interests include the rule of double effect and the distinction between killing and allowing to die. He also has focused on the spiritual dimensions of the practice of medicine. Dan was also tapped by President Obama to serve on the Presidential Commission for the Study of Bioethical Issues from 2010 to 2017. Just on a personal note, I had the great pleasure of helping to lead the happily successful effort to bring Dan back to Georgetown a few years ago. And we spent quite a bit of time together establishing the multifaceted cross-campus faculty, clinical, and now leadership roles that I just described. Dan is really our poster child for our efforts at the university to bring important cross-disciplinary programs together, which is very much one of our long-term goals. Dan has truly exceeded our expe expectations when we recruited him back, and I have great respect for his work and for him personally. And so it is really a personal pleasure for me to introduce Dr. Dan Somacy and invite him to the podium to discuss care and the close of life. Please join me in welcoming Dr. Somacy. Thank you, uh, Ed, for that very gracious uh, introduction. Um, welcome to all of you, to Georgetown's historic guest in uh, Hall and to the Kennedy Institute of Ethics uh, program on care at the close of life. Um, we're really glad you're all here. Uh, we also have some folks who are joining us via a live stream uh, link, um, so we want to welcome them as well. Um, should any of you wish to follow the live stream or the live captioning, um, either from uh, Gaston Hall or from some, from some other location, you can go to the Kennedy Institute's uh, website at conversationsinbioethics.org, uh, and you will find the necessary links there. Um, as the Italian uh, author Umberto Eco uh, once said, it is necessary to meditate early and often on the art of dying to succeed later in doing it properly just once. Now, this evening, we have a thoughtful and intimate conversation about caring for others as they face the ends of their lives. 
We'll have a chance to hear from three people with personal and professional uh, connections uh, to the act of caregiving. Uh, the first uh, of our uh, speakers is John Duberstein, uh, a lawyer who's had a very busy career as assistant federal public defender for the Middle District of North Carolina um, and is the father of two young boys. Um, his late wife, Nina Riggs, was a poet and the author of the New York Times best-selling book, The Bright Hour, a memoir of living and dying. And if any of you have not read it, I recommend it to you. It's a terrific volume. Um, it was published shortly after her death at the age of 39 in late February 2017 from aggressive breast cancer with an epilogue written by John. Uh, since her death, John has taken on the role of sharing her wisdom and sharing his own experiences in caring for her with a wide audience through a blog, through speaking engagements, and other media. I think it's a great gesture of his generosity to all of us as fellow mortals uh, in that John shares his personal reflections on caring for a loved one who is living with a terminal illness uh, and also helps as many people as possible to get to know his wife through promoting her book, which was a series of beautiful essays about the moments of life that give it meaning even when death can no longer be postponed. Please join me in welcoming John Duberstein. Our uh, second uh, panelist is Perry Ann Reed, um, who is a healthcare administrator and clinical ethicist. Uh, currently, she's the executive director of the Wake Med Children's Hospital in Raleigh, North Carolina. Uh, at Wake Med and in her previous position at Texas Children's Hospital in Houston, Texas, where she was director of ethics and palliative care, Perry Ann has extensive experience dealing with ethical issues for families and patients when the patient is a child who is facing advanced or terminal illness. At Texas Children's, she led the clinical ethics consult team in tandem with physician ethicists across this 900-bed hospital, integrating concerns for the clinical, psychosocial, cultural, spiritual, and institutional aspects of decision-making to focus on the best interests of pediatric patients. In addition, uh, Perry Ann was the caregiver and medical decision-maker for her parents as they faced their final illnesses one from a long-term chronic illness and the other in a sudden traumatic event. Perry Ann has an MBA from the University of Texas, an MS in bioethics from Columbia University, and a post-master's certificate in palliative care from Fordham University. Pretty well qualified. Um, please join me in welcoming Perry Ann Reed um, to our conversation. And the last of our conversation uh, partners tonight is Eduardo Barrera, um, who is the chair of the Department of Palliative Care, Rehabilitative and Integrative Medicine at the University of Texas MD Anderson Medical uh, Cancer Center, where he is the F.T. McGraw Chair in the Treatment of Cancer. Eduardo has been a leader in the development of the field of palliative care, a field that seeks to, quote, improve the quality of life of patients and families facing problems associated with life-threatening illness through the prevention and relief of suffering by means of early identification and the impeccable assessment and treatment of pain and other problems, physical, psychosocial, and spiritual." Unquote. Far from being something that ought to be sought or only at the end of life, palliative care can be effective early in the course of an illness in combination with life-prolonging therapies. Uh, Dr. Bruera has focused his career on developing palliative care nationally and internationally. He's done this through clinical care, empirical research, education, and program development. He founded the academic fellowships in palliative care at uh, Edmonton, Alberta, and at MD Anderson. Uh, he has also established numerative, numerous palliative care programs in Latin America, India, and different areas of Europe. He's written over 1,200 articles and edited more than 30 books and lectures widely. 
He was trained in medical oncology in Argentina and undertook a research fellowship at the University of Alberta in Edmonton, Canada, where he later directed the clinical and academic programs at the Cross Cancer Institute in, uh, uh, beginning in 1984 before being recruited to MD Anderson in 1999. Please join me in welcoming uh, Eduardo Pereira. Well, here, here's our style. I'm um, an academic who's supposed to be a TV interviewer, and that's what we're going to try to do tonight, so this is more um, a, of a conversation. Um, and um, I thought that one of the best ways we could do that would be by starting our focus, as good medical ethics always should, uh, with the perspective of the patient um, and perhaps those who uh, love them and care for them. Um, so I'm going to ask uh, John the, f uh, the first question. I'd like you to um, um, talk to us a little bit about um, your life with your late wife, uh, Nina, um, and uh, the journey you had together from the sort of first moment you get the diagnosis of this catastrophic illness to the point of learning that it's not curable to the point of, um, of uh, actually facing her imminent, uh, imminent death. Um, and I was wondering um, if, as you've done for others, you might share with our audience here some of what that's like for those who haven't really gone through it, particularly um, with a young, uh, young spouse. Yeah, thank you, and thanks for having me here. This is lovely um, to be able to talk about this um, and share Nina's story um, is, is wonderful. Um, the, the basic um, fact, the, the important data points, I guess, of her diagnosis and her death are she was diagnosed in January of 2015 with triple negative breast cancer. She, um, in December of that same year, right before Christmas, we learned that it was metastatic. So those were the two big pivots. I was actually away at a work conference in New Orleans when she called with the pathology report. Um, and that was sort of the first big um, earth shifting under our feet moment where we were certain that, you know, whatever it was, it was going to be benign. It was, she was going to be okay. She was 37 years old. Um, we had two young children. Um, and then we sort of got our minds around that and around what the course of treatment was. We found a doctor we were really comfortable with at Duke University Hospital at the Cancer Center. And then she went through most of a year of treatment before... Um, in the fall of that year, she was having severe back pain and then her spine broke, actually. Um, it was a metastatic break, we learned, in the Duke ER. And from that point on, we knew it was terminal. So it was really less than a year of diagnosis before we knew that, um, that what she was facing was incurable and that whatever the outcome, it was very likely that she was facing uh, mortality at a young age. Um, and then she died um, in February of 2017, so we're, we're actually coming right up on the two-year anniversary of her death. Um, they were all hard blows. I think the, um, the metastatic diagnosis was probably the most, I mean, for obvious reasons, was probably the most unsettling and difficult to get our minds around. But in some ways, it was less of a big shift than the shift from not being a cancer patient to being a cancer patient. Um, and the interesting part about Nina's disease, I mean, everybody dies. I, that's what I came here to tell you all tonight. Um, but not everybody dies the same way, and not even everybody with the same disease dies the same way. So she had a year of relatively slow um, cancer progression throughout most of 2016, where she had some spots in her bones that occasionally needed to be irradiated. But otherwise, she was living her best life during the course of the diagnosis, during most of that year. Um, and, and writing about it, yeah. And, and started writing about it, started writing the manuscript. Well, she started blogging and then writing um, articles and then got to writing a book in that time period. Um, yeah, and then was, was gone um, only um, a short time later once, once that final pivot happened, once the metastases started moving to her soft tissue, she declined very quickly. Um, and I guess the, the big takeaway from that is not that there was one specific point or one particular part that was more important than the others, but that it was a constantly shifting and evolving landscape for us. And right up through the end of life care stuff, 
we were, she, Nina is, was very, very smart and very, very engaged with all of this stuff. Her mom had died of cancer 18 months before she did. She was her mom's primary person for all of her doctor visits and researching the, the treatments and the disease. Um, we knew a lot, we thought, about all of this stuff. And then we went through her mom's decline and her decision to stop care and her death. Um, so the, the hospice and palliative care stuff. And still we were, um, we were kind of overtaken at the end with, there's just, there's no limit to the amount of information that you can use, especially practical information about end of life care. Um, we tried to do everything we could to be prepared for it. We read books, we read articles, we scoured the internet, or at least I did. Um, we, we sort of designated Nina as maybe this is not your, maybe this is not the best role for you, but, um, um, and we still struggled at the end with how to make her, um, her time in hospice the best um, version of that that we could. And, um, you know, in retrospect, I think one of the things you said in the introduction, the fact that palliative care is not coextensive with hospice, that palliative care can be something, um, in retrospect, my supposition, I'm not an expert, I'm not a doctor, I've only been through this in a very limited way, but I feel very strongly that if she had had a palliative care team attached to her care from December of 2015, that perhaps that experience, at least parts of it, might have been um, a lot better and we would have at least felt we had all the information we need, all the control we needed. Um, you know, in a lot of ways, Nina had a really good death. I don't know what a good death is, but I'm gonna say that because she got a lot of the things that she wanted. She had family come and visit her. We brought our dogs, we brought our children. Cousins flew in from all four corners of, of the United States to visit with her. Um, but then in other ways, her priorities were, her primary goal for palliative care was to not experience the respiratory crises that she'd been experiencing. Her main metastasis at that point was to her lungs. Um, and I don't think we were, we were finally able to achieve that objective at least not to my, I don't know if we ever would have been able to achieve it to my satisfaction. I didn't want her to suffer at all, but, um, but, I, but I don't, I think more could have been done and, and might have been done with a more integrated, more forward thinking um, approach to palliative care. Um, and of course that's Monday morning quarterbacking and we had great care and great support throughout. Um, but when your time is short and you're facing an unexpected shortening of someone's life, there's so many things to think about and process on the emotional level and the intellectual level and then on the practical level um, that I don't think you can throw too much at it too early. I think it, it, um, it bears repeating over and over again that people can use as much information about palliative care and about end of life care uh, as early as they can get it. Maybe I'll turn to Perry Ann for a second too. Um, you um, have made a professional career out of helping physicians, families, um, patients, um, mostly pediatric patients, um, make some difficult decisions about um, end-of-life care. Um, um, this is what practical bioethics uh, does, and the, it's the sort of encounter with bioethics that most of us will, uh, will have in our lives. Um, but I also know that you also had some deeply personal experiences as a caregiver on the other side of the equation with uh, deaths of your parents, but their situations were different. Um, can you tell us a little bit about that and particularly how being uh, a professional um, and suddenly thrust in the role of being a caregiver might have been um, uh, a, a curveball for you? So. Yeah, I'd definitely say it was a curveball, but I want to first thank everybody for the opportunity to speak here today, and, and I think this is a topic that needs to continue to be talked about and brought to the forefront um, for many reasons of which have already been stated. So uh, my parents uh, did become, my mom was ill starting when I was a teenager, and um, we moved from Michigan to Texas to get her the proper care. Uh, and she declined very, very, very slowly, uh, had a liver transplant, and uh, didn't do that great after the liver transplant. The liver was great, but everything else shut down. So her journey was very long and arduous, uh, where she was almost completely bedridden, and our family made the decision that we would build out the back of the house, all ADA accessible and um, outdoor 
connections to oxygen tanks and remote control this and remote control that. And this is in the 90s before residential, um, residential building of staying in place was done. Took a lot of work and our, uh, my brothers and I and my dad kind of tag team took care of her. She entered into hospice uh, re very reluctantly because her answer was, I don't have cancer. Why am I going into hospice? And she didn't have cancer. She ended up dying of uh, kidney failure and sepsis, but she couldn't wrap her head around that. And so it was a very traumatic time. My brothers would fly in, all the family would come in, we'd enter into hospice, we'd do seven hours of paperwork at home. It's very demoralizing, you don't know what's gonna happen. And then six months later, she'd graduate from hospice because she hadn't died yet. And they misjudged the time. So we would have a graduating from hospice party and then <laughs> drink champagne and cake. And then like a month later, we would go back into hospice. It'd be another seven hours of paperwork. We'd do the whole thing again. And then lo and behold, she'd graduate again. And then lastly, we entered into hospice. And that time, you know, took a very, very, um, different route and she just literally went to sleep one day and but slept for days uh, without water and ice and and it was you know a, a lot different path we went through all of that it, uh, my dad and i jointly made the decisions on that with input from my brothers and then my dad was very healthy and led a great life and was traveling in europe um, enjoying his his freedom now from being a full-time caregiver with me uh, and was hospitalized while he was there and taken to a remote kind of hospital where they misdiagnosed him as saying he had had a stroke because they had such old equipment in the hospital that they saw something on his brain and said it was a stroke. So that involved uh, for me as his medical durable power of attorney uh, to jump on a plane and fly across the world and try to get him out of a hospital where they didn't speak English and get him on a private plane back to the United States, brought him right back to the Texas Medical Center and quickly found out that it wasn't a stroke. He had had a, he has a brain tumor that we didn't know about. Um, he was an engineer, a very smart man, and uh, had been through the 11 year journey of my mom. It was 11 years with her. And he decided at 80 he wanted to have surgery and have the brain tumor removed, even though he did not have a high survival rate. Uh, my brothers and I honored that, it was his wish. And, and I think that's one part of this, is that you do have to honor what the patient wants, even if it's not what you want. Um, so, we're getting ready for that, and two days before he was due for surgery, he declined so rapidly that um, I called the doctor and said, you know, I know what's happening, and I know he wouldn't want to be like this, and there's no way they're going to do surgery on him in two days. So I very vividly remember sitting in the house by myself, signing the document that said, we're entering into hospice, and um, he passed very peacefully about, like, 12 hours later, it was just fast, fast, fast. So one part of that is that my mom never had palliative care. We didn't know that there was palliative care and this was in the early 90s before palliative care had really gotten out there if you weren't an oncology patient. When my dad got back from Europe, the first place I took him was palliative care. And the doctor that I called to say, we need to put him into hospice, was not his primary physician or his brain surgeon. It was the palliative care doctor that he had just met five days earlier. So um, understanding the fact that palliative care is there for you if you're in a chronic long-term illness, which is what my mom would have benefited from, um, instead of running from doctor to doctor pain doctor to neurologist to surgeon to all of this, palliative care could have guided us, but instead we had to become our own palliative care team in essence. I kept Excel records and binders and all kinds of things of what she needed. And my dad had a great experience because he had palliative care and he had a great hospice experience. And so um, just as John said, you, you don't know. Your, what your diagnosis is doesn't uh, define what your death will be like. 
Um, and, uh, Eduardo, um, so we've had three different deaths uh, described, um, and you've been caring for dying um, patients um, for their physical, emotional, spiritual needs for um, decades now. Um, what do you think are the main points you'd want to make to the um, uh, audience uh, uh, here um, ab about dying? And then maybe particularly for John, who seemed a little troubled by his uh, wife's death and the shortness of breath at the end, is there anything you could say to, uh, say to him that might be um, helpful in terms of what palliative care might, might have been able to do? Um, sure, thank you. And first of all, thanks very much for the organizers of this amazing event. Uh, this is, of course, the most well-recognized uh, ethics group in the world, so it's a great honor for uh, us who have followed all these over the years to, to be able to, to participate uh, and pitch in. I think one of the challenges is that um, when we are diagnosed with the disease that is gonna end our life, the course of that disease is quite variable. It's not always completely predictable. And many times, books and, and doctors and hospices try to sometimes oversimplify the way that the course is going to be quite different. You might have a lung cancer in the right upper lobe of your lung. It might me uh, measure about one inch, and then you might start feeling a bit tired, a bit sleepy, a little bit confused, and then take the bed and end your life in a reasonably comfortable way, exactly that same tumor one inch higher would result in excruciating pain and agony, shortness of breath, um, you know, bleeding from the mouth, etc. And so the, there is quite significant variation in the way things can happen. Some of us might need a little bit more complexity of care than others. And it's important that we have the availability of or, or access to the care that might be depending on how bad we feel. And we held wonderful examples from John and Perry Ann about how that flexibility needs to be there so that when things do not go well for you at home, it doesn't matter. A wonderful palliative care unit in your hospital can take care of you. Also, the way we end our lives has a lot to do with the way we lived our lives. So if I had to be a trend to be somebody who denied things, I will deny that things are going bad. If I had a trend to be a bit depressive, I will get depressed. If I had a trend to be a bit angry, I will get a bit angry. And also my background, if I have a big socioeconomic level uh, and I have a, an excellent support network, probably staying at home is quite feasible for me if I have limited support, and support means two things, uh, money and family. And you could say money because money can also occasionally buy a family, but the reality <laughs> is uh, <laughs> if you have both or one of the two, uh, then staying at home, being taken care of, it, it works quite well. If you do not have those, then other arrangements might be necessary for you. Um, when we are, ourselves getting to the end of our lives, uh, we see things and we value things that do not look very interesting when we're not facing end of life. So uh, when, we, when we say, well, where is the quality of life of somebody who's very ill? Well, um, in, in general, uh, our quality of life is based on our job and being able to drive, meeting with friends, going out, uh, making some money. And when none of that is available to us, we say, wow, life is totally meaningless because I can go to work, I can drive my car, I can meet with my friends, I can draw an income, uh, I'm gonna need help to go to the bathroom. This is really horrible. And when we ask Americans, they say, yeah, this is horrible life, it's quite meaningless. Two years later, when they are very ill, they find meaning in other things that they were not finding meaning on earlier because they had other issues, like a conversation a visit from a loved one, music, a bird, whatever is there that, and so part of the challenge for us as caregivers and for us as relatives is to identify those things that are gonna be meaningful at that time and make them happen, help the person make them happen until, until our, our life ends. So um, I think it's, it's nice to have access, I think both John and Perianne made uh, wonderful comments about the fact that 
getting access to that care is necessary. Regrettably, it's something that at this point is not that accessible, even in the most sophisticated uh, medical centers uh, around the world. And so uh, as uh, people who are going to get sick and die, it's important that you uh, see who has it, who doesn't have it, and that we all ask our, our administrators, our bosses, our politicians, um, if, if you all, all of us are going to die, and it's never going to be an easy moment. It's always going to be stressful. It's always going to be uh, difficult. So why don't we really have the programs that will address that? Because we might need an orthopedic surgeon, an ophthalmologist, or a dermatologist. And it might vary. 100% of us are going to die. So really thinking about having some planning. And you know, sometimes I tell that to my deans and presidents and so on. And when I tell them we're all going to die, they say yes. But they're, they're powerful. They're not going to die. So uh, <laughs> now what I'm telling you is you're going to die. And you're going to die soon because you're not that young anymore. And <laughs> I think it's starting to have some effect in getting some action. Uh, but your presence here uh, might, uh, might help you uh, think about ways you can uh, make those services happen in the future. Mm -hmm. can, can palliative care eliminate all the suffering at the end of life? Clearly not. Uh, it, it, suffering is unavoidable when we're getting to the end of life. And you should not believe uh, somebody who tells you, oh, no, we can control every single symptom with palliative care and hospice and so on, because that's unreasonable. And that doesn't make sense, right? I mean, uh, I learned that many, many years ago uh, about the way we are suffering very much. When I was uh, finding mm, my wife is sitting there, and uh, there was a cockroach in our bathroom. And I had to make that cockroach disappear because my wife doesn't like cockroaches. <laughs> and so I had my best soccer t-shirt, and I tried to kill the cockroach. And it was absolutely clear that the cockroach was not interested in dying. <laughs> it was even playing ill, playing dead, and hiding, and so on. And it was a terrible time for the cockroach. And, <laughs> I realized that evolutionary in our DNA, dying is not a good idea. And, and so suffering will occur. The problem is there is a lot of unnecessary suffering. There is a lot of suffering that could be maintained, treated very well. John mentioned one source of suffering that requires a bit more sophisticated care. That is people really getting very short of breath. And there are medications we can use now to decrease the swelling around the lung, like corticosteroids. There are medications like opiates that can reduce the message from the lung to the brain. And finally, there are a little bit more sophisticated treatments to make us go to sleep so that we're not that aware of symptoms that might be bothersome that we can use. So in some cases, a little bit more sophistication uh, might be necessary, and although it's not completely impossible to uh, abolish some suffering. A lot can be alleviated. Mm -hmm. That's terrific. Um, Perry Ann, I wanted to return, um, if I could, to your work, um, particularly your pre uh, previous job at uh, Texas Children's, uh, where you were directing the Ethics Consult Service. Um, can you uh, help us, help the audience here understand a bit more about how clinical ethics consults can um, um, help uh, people who are struggling with decisions at the end of life, like when it's time to stop um, uh, life-sustaining treatments or um, discontinue a ventilator, those kinds of questions? Sure, so uh, clinical ethics consults are readily available in just about every hospital in the country, even rural ones, but they're critically important. They are teams of multidisciplinary people, so it's not just a bunch of philosophers sitting around a table or a bunch of doctors. It's physicians, it's nurses, it's social work, chaplaincy. Hopefully you have somebody who has some training in ethics or at least ethical framework thinking. Um, as Not well, that there's anything wrong with the that's right. Not that I know, I've got a lot but of them in this room. I know, so. but you just have to think through that. You don't want all those people making your decision all the time. No offense. So um, <laughs> the the other part of that is that it's it's really uh, positive to make sure that you have lay people or community people, somebody who's in your hospital who has suffered something. So like John being on an ethics committee would be very powerful. So those committees get together and uh, discuss, uh, they go through the medical record, they interview all the clinicians, they interview the nursing staff, 
um, support services, then they go talk to the family, and then they have meetings with the um, medical team, and then they have meetings with the family, and then you have a meeting with everybody. So it's a, it's a long and arduous process, but you're making very important decisions, and you want to be able to do that uh, using a framework. And so those processes are called upon by either nurses or doctors or families or anybody who's stuck in this position. Um, sometimes they're controversial, sometimes they have legalities tied to them, uh, but probably the biggest skill that an ethicist can have is facilitation. So I was saying to John, you know, really every ethicist or anybody who's doing ethics consults should be able to mediate and facilitate because they are mediated, facilitated uh, discussions where you're looking what is the root problem, what are the ethical things that you can say for and against it, and really the biggest part is what is the acceptance of the least bad option? Because when you're having these, there's no good option. There's not a right answer, there's not a wrong answer. So what is the least bad option for that patient or that family? Does it differ for children versus adults? Yeah. It does. Yeah. It differs for children and adults, and um, th there are not lots of people who focus on pediatric bioethics. Um, we all know each other very, very well um, in the circle. So one of the things that, it, as an adult, you have a dyadic relationship. So it's you and your doctor. You get to make your own decisions. You can accept or refuse treatment. If it's a pediatric patient, then you have a triadic relationship because now you have the parent, the patient, and the doctor. And it's presumed that the child doesn't have decision-making capacity and the parents have the right to refuse treatment. But when parents refuse treatment, um, then the best interest uh, standard for children comes into the equation. Uh, so trying to balance are the parents making the right decisions for the kids or not is a, is a very difficult thing. And, and then you get in, of course, to consent and assent. And so in pediatrics, there's what we call the sevens. Zero to seven, the parents make the decisions with informed permission and, and try to get the child to be cooperative. But what's fascinating is that there's a lot of best practice and data out there that says between seven and 14, parents give informed permission, but then you get the assent of the child. So you're empowering the child, if they're developmentally appropriate, uh, to help make their decisions. And, and you hear the word 14, and at 14, kids who've been very sick or chronically ill or multiple cancers are pretty wise, and we need to be listening to them. Um, and then from 14 to 20, uh, 21, it, it's you know informed permission and consent of the patient. But that seven to 14 is really um, an interesting time, especially for complex children, uh, kids who have complex illnesses, because they can make more decisions than people realize. Mm -hmm. Speaking of uh, children, John, I know um, uh, you've uh, shared a little bit and your wife in her book shared a little bit about talking to your own children about um, her um, illness, and maybe you'd be willing to share with us a little bit about that. I mean, it's got to be a very difficult thing to um, tell your children that um, their mom um, is, is dying. How does, how does one handle that? Well, um, in response to Perry Ann's comments, I can safely say that all children are complex, um, <laughs> increasingly so as they get older, um, but even at a young age. Um, we, I mean, one of the things that we did we all, Nina and I conceived of ourselves as being super forward thinking. I mean, like I said, we'd been through a terminal cancer experience with her mom. Um, so, and from that perspective, Nina knew what it felt like to lose a parent. I mean, she was an adult, of course, so it's very different, but we felt very aware of the issues and we thought we were being very open with the kids and, um, you know, obviously filtering, not telling them as we would an adult, but certainly told the kids about her diagnosis. One of, one of the funny things that happened that, that sort of tied our kids really um, into the diagnosis was my, son, my older son and I have birthdays two days apart in January. And um, that week was the week that Nina was diagnosed with cancer and my older son was diagnosed with type 1 diabetes 
Um, in fact, we were on the way to the hospital to take my son for his initial diagnosis. I had already, I'm diabetic, I had already sort of diagnosed him, um, but to take him for his initial treatment. And we stopped by the breast cancer center to get Nina's pathology report, um, which was in the same building as her doctor's office where, where we had to go before we could, she could report to the hospital. So it felt like everyone was being diagnosed together. It felt like sort of a group, a family crisis. You know, 50% of us were being diagnosed with chronic disease. Um, and we talked very much with the kids at that point about what it meant to have cancer. That, and, and part of the narrative was, you know, you're, we, we called Nina's mom, um, Grand Jan. That's what the kids call her. Her name was Janet. Um, and I, I have, I can't say it any other way, so I'm, I'm going to wind up saying it anyway. So I'll just explain it, even though none of you need to know that information. <laughs> um, we said to the kids, it's not necessarily like Grand Jan's cancer. It's a different kind of cancer. Um, you know, your mom's younger. It's in a different part of her body. We don't know all the details yet. We gave them all the information we thought we needed to give them. And then as she went through her treatment, we continued to talk to them about, you know, she would talk to them about what radiation was, what chemotherapy was, um, you know, and not with super buttery analogies. It was pretty much like descriptions of what the stuff looked like and, you know, and how it was infused and all that kind of stuff. Um, and, and how old were they at this time? Th so they when well, at the initial diagnosis, they were, uh, my, my older son was about to turn eight and my younger son was five. So um, the, it was the week of his eighth birthday. Um, and we enrolled them in Kids Can at Duke where Nina was being treated, which is a terrific program. It's amazing. They, they do, they introduce them to an oncologist. They talk about how cancer works in the body. They do all this stuff that, you know, it, it just, you know, anybody explaining it multiple times is going to include stuff that you maybe leave out. So it was, it was fantastic. And the best part of it for them was they met a whole bunch of other kids whose parents were being treated for cancer. So it normalizes the whole thing in a way that is actually much more natural than feeling like you're the only kid whose mom has cancer. Um, but on the way home from a kids can meeting, we, we blew a flat tire and um, I was trying to fix it in a parking lot outside of Duke Hospital and Nina started chatting up the kids about what they had learned at kids can that night and they said, well, we all had to share something personal at this meeting and they just wanted us to talk about how we got there. And we said, um, at this point, Nina was, um, was metastatic, but relatively stable. And the kids said, well, you, we told them you were really sick, but now you're doing much, much better. And because her hair had come back in, because her skin was a normal color, because she wasn't sick every morning, she could drive them to school, all this stuff. And it hit us like a ton of bricks. I mean, the kids immediately afterwards were hit by that same ton of bricks, but we were like devastated that we hadn't shepherded them to that point, having been so forward thinking. Um, and I think the lesson, I don't know what the lesson was, honestly. I mean, I think every kid's different. Kids infer different things from different signals, but kids are absorbing this stuff constantly. Whatever you're doing, there is an implicit message in it if your kids are around you when it's happening. And um, we knew all that stuff, but we still were caught up by it, you know, and, and Nina had to say to the kids in the back seat, like she climbed into the back seat of the car with her broken back and everything, um, and there was tears and all of that stuff. I mean, it was, it was very emotional. I was fixing a tire, so I was emotional about that, but, um, and I didn't fix the tire. I couldn't, we didn't have a spare, so we limped home on a slightly flat tire. Um, but she said to them, look, no, I have incurable cancer at this point. There's no other treatment. We're going to try everything that we can within reason to, to fix it, but um, it's never going away, basically, at this point. Um, and it, the lesson for us, at least, was that you can't, you can't just say something once to a kid and then expect them to infer everything else in light of that. What they will naturally do, if there are any signs at all that their mom is going to be okay, that's what they're going to assume. Um, and not that you should go out of your way to stamp out all hope that children have at an early age. I don't believe in that as a parent, although it can serve a purpose. Um, but I do think you have the repetition, being explicit in moments where it matters is really important in talking to kids about this stuff. And then trusting them with difficult information, trusting kids. You have to learn how to communicate it the right way. You want to give it context. You want to give it meaning. Um, but kids need to know this stuff because their whole you know, universe was built around their mom. And, um, and so they were naturally, like anybody would, assuming that things are going to get back to normal when things looked like they got back to normal. And, um, and even though um, we knew all of the stuff and we read all of the books and thought we had our arms around all of the things that we were supposed to do, 
Um, they drew conclusions from that stuff as much as they did from the things we said to them explicitly. Eduardo, maybe uh, for the benefit of our audience, we've been throwing around a lot of terms and things. It might be helpful to sort of distinguish between hospice and palliative care. We uh, sometimes in medicine presume people know the names of these words, and maybe you could um, um, uh, talk to us about that, what the difference is between the two, why did it take us so long to uh, actually recognize that these are specialties in medicine and we ought to be doing this? Um, Absolutely. Wonderful. Well, hospice comes from the UK hospice movement. Of course, you could say that hospice has been there for a thousand years, but in reality, the modern hospice movement started in the 60s. So it's, it's a movement of the 60s. You could see us as wearing tattoos and nose rings and all those things, because it was a fringe movement. It's a movement that started when um, hospitals were writing off patients because they could not cure their disease. And then they were picked up by these protest movement of hospice that was taking them to homes in the UK, in suburbs of London, and basically they were receiving care that was physical and emotional and spiritual. And all the basis of what we do now started in the 60s as part of the UK hospice movement. Um, the UK hospice movement was based mostly, truly associated with people who are facing the end of their lives. As that movement crossed the Atlantic, especially into Canada, uh, it started to be practiced in acute care hospitals, and that's where Balmount called it palliative care. And basically it meant, we're gonna start taking care of you a little bit earlier, not when you are facing the end of your life, because a lot of your suffering might happen way before you get to the end of your life when you are getting your cancer treatment, your heart treatment, your liver treatment, at that time, we can really start helping you. And that's where palliative care emerged. Uh, in reality, as, as Dan very appropriately pointed out, if you think about it, we're not a new movement. We've been around for about 50 years. Many specialties of medicine, including my previous medical oncology, critical care, emergency medicine, are all more than a decade younger than we are. And you have them in every single hospital, every medical school and so on, because those were born within the system. We were born out of wedlock. And so we were not a product of Royal Marsden or Harvard or any place like that. We were out. And therefore, to get in was not easy. It was very, very difficult, and it continues to be very, very difficult. And medical schools have very weak structures for palliative care. They, they have orthopedics, they have ophthalmology, they have dermatology, they don't have big departments of palliative medicine. Uh, big hospitals have, again, internal medicine, and they have pediatrics, and they have orthopedics. They don't have palliative medicine departments, sometimes a little section, sometimes a group like that. So the reality is, the creation of these has been very difficult. And palliative care units that are the intensive care units for human suffering are still not very common. Now, if you Google palliative care, it merges with hospice in the United States. There's, there's palliative care and hospice association. So patients are afraid and oncologists are very afraid of sending a patient to palliative care because they say, well, it, it's gonna take away their hope and so on. So, at MD Anderson, we made an experiment that was to say, what if we start calling it supportive care? And then we changed nothing. All we did is to change <laughs> the sign at the door. <laughs> and in six months, we had a 41% increase in business, and our patients were referred not only two or three months before dying, 10 months before dying. And so it basically took some of the taboo associated with palliative care I made it a little bit easier to, to send uh, patients earlier. But I think we heard from the wonderful cases described by both Perry Ann and John, the fact that the journey towards the end of our lives starts way, way before we take the bed, when we're getting treatment. And that would be the perfect moment to access supportive care and palliative care. And that requires your hospital to have a big, ambulatory, supportive, and palliative care department. Because when you're ill, you're still 
walking and doing things. You're not in a bed in an inpatient facility. So you need to have access to outpatient services, big outpatient services where you can get care for early. Otherwise, uh, you won't access early care. You will access always very late care. And regrettably, there are very few outpatient supportive care and palliative care centers available, and I think that would be a wonderful way to, uh, to access that early. How do you convince administrators of hospitals to do this? And you don't have to turn toward the one next to you in, uh, in answering this, but... Right. Well, I think there's some advantage. Uh, the, one of them is, um, I think, as my favorite Nobel Prize says, times are A-changing. And therefore, I, I don't like any of the other ones. That's, that's one I really like. And basically, uh, there is an increased emphasis on human suffering an increased emphasis on personhood. So uh, I think the, the tide is starting to, to, to go into your shore, and as an administrator, be aware that patient experience, that patient suffering counts. Second, money is running out, and palliative care saves millions of dollars. So, and the reason for that is the patient gets better care and less expensive care. There are very few areas of medicine where you can improve care, getting less chemotherapy, less MRIs, less dialysis, less transplantation, less you know, LVADs and so on. So some savvy groups have learned that by having palliative care, you don't only spend money, you save millions of dollars. And so what is stopping it? I think what is stopping it is my generation a biomedical industrial complex that never got it. And because we, we did not learn it, we did not study it, and it's not like the current bosses are bad. They went to medical school with me. They did residency with me. They're trying to do the best, but they never learned. And so the reality is they are now not understanding that there is another, uh, another real food to that table, and it's the personhood suffering. And that by establishing that and investing in that, you are going to help patients and families, your reputation is going to go much higher, and you're going to save millions of dollars. So I think the opportunity is very, very great, but uh, regrettably to me, we need a generational exchange. We need a new generation to come from a post-industrial uh, approach, and then I think it's going to happen. For for Perry Ann and, uh, and, and John to um, be each of you, um, is, it, is it sort of hard to stop? I mean, that's what we typically hear is the person who wants to continue to have treatment and, you know, thinks that um, medicine, there'll be another, if I can just get through this next round of chemotherapy, something else will come around, there'll be something else available for me. Um, um, in the three uh, stories, was it hard to, hard to stop and sort of say, um, this is not really, you know, uh, going to extend life anymore, and we ought to take a different course. Or, um, how did that go? Maybe you could start, John. Yeah. Um, it surprisingly, I guess, in in some ways, was not one of the harder questions that we faced. Mm -hmm. By the time we got there, um, like I said, Nina had had a metastasis of a very aggressive form of cancer that there was no second line treatment for, um, and at the point where we made this decision for her to go into hospice. The only real thing that they were holding out any hope for treatment-wise was an um, immunotherapy drug that was going to be given off. It, there was no trial or anything like that. They were, they were going to try it and see if it worked. Um, some people had had a response to it. Um, and she wound up not making it long enough to get to the point where she could have that um, treatment. But when her doctor, her oncologist actually came to the pulmonology wing and said, look, I have to say this, I, you don't have, don't feel pressured, but we can throw more chemotherapy at it if you want to. Um, she said, it's available, and I feel like it's my duty to tell you that, and I'm an oncologist, so I want, it's a cancer and I want to kill it. Mm -hmm. um, and, but in the course of her care with that same oncologist, who I thought did a really good job of not being super filtering with us, she had also talked about her suspicions, which she couldn't prove with one patient case, that basically, when Nina was given her initial um, um, dose of chemotherapy before surgery, um, 
and then when they did, they ultimately, she had a, um, a mastectomy, the chemotherapy did nothing. It didn't shrink the tumor at all, it had no effect. Um, and then when she'd had the, the post-surgery treatment, it was only a few months after that that the metastasis happened, and her doctor basically surmised informally that chemotherapy, all chemotherapy practically did in her case. It was still the right course of treatment, it was still absolutely the standard of care, and I think it was the right decision, but it had basically compromised her immune system, and each time had allowed the cancer to spread a little bit more. Um, and that's not true for most people with cancer. For most people with cancer, it does that and it kills the cancer. And in Nina's case, that just wasn't true. Um, so I think because we had seen that repeatedly, she'd also had a, a small course of chemo in January right before she died to try and prep her and get beat back the cancer in her lungs and get her ready for this immunotherapy drug. Um, and then that hastened the onset of this metastasis in her lungs, seemingly. Um, so we felt like at that point we knew what we were dealing with. We had communicated with the oncologist about it repeatedly. We theorized our own, you know, sort of putting things together afterwards. Um, she was suffering, you know, she had suffered through the broken back and she had suffered through a whole bunch of stuff, but the lung stuff was really dramatic and acute and not fun for her. Um, and we had gone through end of life care with her mom. Um, which I think lived experience when you're dealing, it, it, it's a false cognate in some ways because obviously everyone dies differently, everyone lives differently, um, and Nina's death was not the same as her mom's, but it gives you a wealth of experience emotionally in terms of decision making. Being a proxy for someone else is not the same as being the person who's dying. I don't mean to suggest that, but it does teach you a lot about how you're gonna respond in that situation, what becomes important towards the end of life versus what is secondary. Um, so I think we both had a fair amount of information already and a fair amount of experience. We made the decision whether or not to, to just stop treatment altogether and go to hospice. I mean, we, we had been in the Duke Hospital for a week with them trying to diagnose what was going on with her. So we'd had plenty of time facing, sort of staring down the, the oncoming train. I don't think it took us 10 minutes, 15 minutes. It was, a, it was one of the briefest discussions we had. Um, and Nina said, you know, are we on the same page about this? I, I don't see any reason to have any more chemotherapy. And, and my great surprise in that moment in retrospect was that I didn't say, no, we have to, I mean, I, the last thing in the world that I wanted was to not have a cure, to not have a, a treatment even. Um, but it was so clear at that point that, um, you know, that, that neither one of us really questioned it once we made the decision. Um, and I feel very fortunate, I guess, in some ways, because that's one of the things that I would least like to look back on with regret. Um, but somehow, by the time we got to that point, whether it was because we communicated well between each other or because of the doctor's ability to communicate, which I think was, was pretty high, um, we felt like we were prepared to make that decision. And Perry Ann, particularly with your uh, dad, it was a position that um, many um, uh, people are often in is making a decision on behalf of someone who can't speak for himself or herself. Um, um, uh, some of my own empirical studies have shown how stressful that yeah. can that can be. Um, but you seem to say you were, you know, sure that this man who wanted to have an operation uh, <laughs> to, um, wouldn't have wanted treatment um, two days later. How mm -hmm. how did you do that? <laughs> yeah. Well, you know, I think one of the things that we've talked about is uh, understanding and having really, really critically clear conversations, honest, brutal conversations with the physicians, with the nurses, with your family. Uh, and with my mom not having a cancer and trying to figure out, is she really gonna die in a six month time period or not? We had struggled through all of that and my dad had helped me figure that out and he had figured that out. We, one of the things that my family did to make sure that we could handle all this stress, because it's continual stress, was we used humor a lot. <laughs> and I know it sounds like you can't use humor when you're talking about somebody's di dying, but it was the only release we had. And, and we, we had some really funny humor things um, that we did to handle that. On my dad's side, since we had gone through all of that up and down and up and down and up and down, um, we had already had discussions with him, and like I said, he was a very, very brilliant engineer and businessman, and his decline was so rapid that I knew for an instant that there was no way he would want to even continue 
to go forward. And, and that's on the basis of uh, explicit discussions? Um, no, well, some discussions, but not really. Just yeah. because we had been through such a difficult journey with my mom, mm -hmm. um, and that we knew he, you know, he had an advanced directive and all of that, but he wasn't at the point where he was on a ventilator. He was at home. I mean, when I signed the hospice papers, he was at home, down the hall. Uh, I was taking care of him. And sure enough, the hospice person came, did my seven hours of paperwork, which I could do by heart now, and um, did all that and got the nursing care in, got him some medication, and he, he, I think he was ready to go. And so he, he didn't want to live this way. And so I think he went a lot quicker because I'm convinced he knew that I didn't want to live this way. But when I had to make that decision, it was very hard because I did all the things things that I could think of in an ethical analysis. I tried to pull myself out of it and put myself as the ethicist, and that did not work. Um, <laughs> there were a lot of tears calls to my brother and my husband and you know my kids who were very, very close to him. And just, I, I tried, but it, it must be like a physician trying to make their own decisions. Um, I did the best framework I could. I wrote pro-con lists. I put everything in the right buckets. I did the whole thing. But in, in the end, it was, it was my gut, and it was, I hope this is right. Now, there are, there are days I still wonder. I still wonder, did I sign that too quick? Should I given him another week or two to see? And, and those things, you know, every decision when you're dealing with end of life, you will have things that haunt you. We were talking about that earlier. And that's probably one decision that haunts me, is did I give him enough time? What if I give him another week? What if I give him another two days? What would have happened? Um, and so those who are left behind need to remember that you just, you do the best you can with the information that you have, and you take the critical um, hard details and put those in your own personal decision-making framework and what you and your family need. But having these conversations in advance, you can't predict everything. So people say, oh, well, I did my advanced directive. Well, okay, great, except for your advanced directive is you know, five check boxes and 90% of the time, the things don't line up. <laughs> and so you, you think, well, I don't wanna be kept on a ventilator. Okay, well, do you wanna not be kept on a ventilator for 20 minutes? Do you not want to be ventilated at all? Do you want to be on a ventilator for two weeks and then you give up? I mean, that doesn't really say anything. They're good documents legally and they're good documents for conversations, but in my experience, they don't answer every question. You just have to do the best. And Eduardo, one thing I just wanted to come back to you on, and we have a couple of minutes left here, is you've mentioned an number of times um, talking about um, spiritual care as part of palliative care. Um, I mean, is that something doctors should be doing, do you think, um, treating patients' spiritual needs? Um, uh, and then if you multiply that, um, spiritual and religious concerns are often also mixed in with cultural differences. I mean, um, how, do, how does palliative care accomplish that, and, um, and is it really right to be doing it? Oh, absolutely. I think that's, that's, that's when we were discussing the fact that at this point you might be not feeling particularly spiritual or religious because you got exams to take and you got uh, job issues and mortgages and those things and that's, that's fair, that's the way it is. But um, when, when you get really ill, um, spirituality happens to be a very, very important dimension in your life and it helps you cope. And we usually say in palliative care there are three things that are going to make your life at the end of life much easier. Uh, that are money, family, and a faith. And we in palliative care cannot give you any of the three. So that tells you a little bit of our limitation. But, but your, your spirituality and religiosity are an important uh, source of support. We've done several, several studies with our patients and basically, of course, we're in the deep south, but 90% uh, 90, 90 of our patients are spiritual and religious. Mm -hmm. So for us to ignore that important dimension 
of their potential well-being and also the potential fact that while 90% plus are spiritual and religious, 50% of them have some level of spiritual pain. That is, pain deep in the soul, not physical. Is, is, is God punishing me? What is going to happen to me? Why is this happening to me and not to someone who is not a good person? And all those spiritual questions of, of distress, uh, we should pay attention. It's important. It's a major dimension of care of our patients. So, so asking those questions as doctors yes. and supporting these patients, and of course, when things get to a certain level of complexity, making 100% sure that we have a chaplain uh, close by who can be brought in to deal with those more complex issues. Uh, and I say more complex issues because unfortunately we don't have enough chaplains to see everybody, mm -hmm. but the reality is that um, making that evaluation, that assessment, that support, giving the person the permission to talk about the spirituality and religiosity to us is a very important um, aspect of, uh, of relieving their suffering. Um, but maybe I'll uh, turn it back to John a little on that. I mean, I, I take it that neither you nor Nina are, are r religious persons, but yet when you read, um, you know, her uh, her book, the quotes from Emerson, Montaigne, the or the, the the color orange, um, there seems to be a sort of spiritual um, sense to that. Is that something you'd um, agree was there? Was it a philosophical um, a, a, approach? Um, was she um, someone who was always um, turning to those sorts of sources? Did she find them only at the end of life? Um, tell, tell us more about whether what she went through in this sort of transcendent sense fits a, a, a label of spirituality or was it um, something different than that? Um, so the, it's interesting. I mean, the color orange reference, which is sort of a leitmotif in her book, really comes from her mom, mm -hmm. who was more, I, I hate to label either one of them really, but I think her mom was more spiritual. She was more spiritually questing, more overtly spiritual in her quest to find meaning um, throughout her life, not just at the end of life. Um, Nina, I think, kind of lamented and, and mourned in a way um, the, the lack of her of a spiritual connection to guide her. Um, she didn't have that thread necessarily, but I think she found it in a different way. I think she would, I don't know, I don't know what Nina would say. That's probably a stupid thing for me to say, but I, my apprehension of it is, I'm a lawyer. I'm gonna caveat heavily. Um, I feel like she's probably gonna get angry with me even though she's dead. Um, I, my, my take on it is that she, what was important to her was always, before she was diagnosed, before she was ever a patient, was meaningful existence. And I think that's why, I mean, her, her, so Emerson, Ralph Waldo Emerson is her great, great, great grandfather. Um, so she had a connection to that and to the New England sort of um, transcendental ethic. Um, and she read Emerson and appreciated his work and his, um, his, his essays before she was diagnosed with a terminal disease. But I think, um, actually Montaigne was actually more of her muse on meaning um, in terms of how to actually approach death and dying or mortality or the fact that we are all gonna die. I know I already said that, but I'm gonna repeat it. Um, and then Emerson was a little bit more the transcendental part of it. The, the passages in her book where she quotes directly from Emerson are all about his sort of, the, these moments that I think of as being sort of um, new agey from when I was younger, but are actually much older than that. You know, the, the, the sort of prototypical person seeing the entire universe in a, in a drop of rain or something like that. I mean, that all comes from Emerson and people like him, people as far back as, as ancient Greece, I think. Um, so that for her, I think, was a way of accessing that because Emerson was a preacher, he was a believer, but he was, he was a Unitarian preacher. So, you know, this sort of bridges <laughs> the gap between materialism and, and spirituality and religiosity. Um, but I think it was, he, you know, Emerson was so smart and he was so talented and he was a poet which Nina was too, and a writer, um, that I think that made that stuff more um, digestible to her. It rang true for her and her experience, um, especially the experience of nature, which um, I know a lot of people find transcendence in nature without having any particular creed uh, or, a, or a religious affiliation. And I think those were the kinds of things that were, I, I uh, mentioned that she was in a hospice facility. And one of the things that was so great about the hospice facility, whatever the, the 
ups and downs of the palliative care approach that we had was that it had big windows and a door that led outside with no steps. So we could put her in a wheelchair for the first few days she was there. And we're in North Carolina, so we had some really nice warm days even in February. Um, and she could actually experience being outside. She was not cloistered, she was not tethered at that point, and she felt, she found meaning in that. She really found great joy in that. She was still um, posting on social media at that mm -hmm. point about, the, and literally about the joy she was finding in nature. Mm -hmm. um, and so, yeah, I mean, I think the religiosity, spirituality part was not a huge part of our everyday life, um, but absolutely, I mean, if you look at those things as a way to find meaning in your day-to-day -day or in the greater sum of your your life's work um then she was that's absolutely what she was reaching for in those moments and throughout her life i mean that's what i think art was to her that's what writing was to her that's what being a mom was to her um she was always trying to create some sense of particularly for the kids but also for me and for us in general a sense of she called it magic um, but I think of it as being just like something that's more than just the sum of its parts or more than just the to-do list or more than just the, you know, do you have a job, can you pay the bills kind of stuff where she wanted things to feel special, elevated um, and memorable, things that the kids and, and us could hold um, as our own, you know, take ownership of in that way. And, um, and I think that's where the book came from. You know, she was diagnosed um, as, as terminal, um, I mean, she, excuse me, she was, she, she published her essay in the New York Times in September um, of 2016. Her, her manuscript was handed in in January of 2017. Um, and she'd been writing before that, um, blogging and writing essays before that, but the bulk of her work was written in the four months, the last four months she was alive, and she and was alive for another month after she handed in the manuscript. So, um, so it was that important to her. Um, I don't think it was just about writing a book. I think it was about finding meaning bringing a whole bunch of things together. Um, and you know, the, the metaphor is really obvious, but I'm not a writer, so I can get away with it. Um, but just, you know, that she was able to synthesize all of those things. Her mom's death, Freddie, our, our son's diagnosis with diabetes, her terminal cancer, being a young parent saying goodbye to kids, um, wondering what all of that meant, and being able to put that literally into a package before she, before she died. Um, I think that was her, that was sort of her liturgy, you know, her way of, of um, defining the contours of meaning and what was important to her at that point in her life. Mm -hmm. yeah. Well, um, I'd like to uh, um, thank the th uh, three of you for wonderful, um, interesting, provocative, really, you know, in many ways, heartfelt conversation. Um, obviously, an hour doesn't do justice to the, to the topics we're, uh, we're dealing with, um, but I did want to make sure we give some time to the audience to ask some, um, uh, some questions. Um, so if you um, do have any out there, it's going to be hard for me with the lights to see. I'll have to uh, uh, look this way. Um, please um, uh, don't, uh, don't speak until uh, the mic has been brought to you. There's somebody I already see in the back there, so there are people with microphones to bring to you. Um, uh, and um, uh, please try to keep your, and your questions or comments brief so that we can hear from a number of people. Please. Hello. Um, so there's a few of us that are here as students from the School of Medicine. And I think as future doctors, we are sort of we, we came tonight because we are interested in thinking about ways that we can incorporate end-of-life care issues into our eventual future practice, trying to get a handle on what that might be like. So what advice might you guys have for uh, different kinds of doctors going into different specialties as far as how we can incorporate, how we can help lead our healthcare networks to be more forward-thinking on end-of-life care issues? Thanks. Uh, well, that's a wonderful question, and I'm glad that you're here. Uh, and, and basically, um, I, I would say this. Um, you're going to be facing suffering for the rest of your life. Um, um, and it's not that you're going to be inflicting suffering, <laughs> you're going to be relieving suffering, but uh, that's going to be part of your, of your daily work. So, investing in your education on the relief of physical, emotional, spiritual, family suffering is very wise. And you may have to do a little bit of research of where to get that because it's not so formally in the curriculum of most medical schools and you're not gonna find a big academic department of palliative medicine, unfortunately, in, in, most, uh, in most medical schools. Uh, and you're not gonna have a big palliative care unit easily in most 
teaching hospitals. Uh, and so therefore doing some research but investing on that is very wise, no matter what the final specialty you choose. So that would be um, one important thing to, to take home with you because uh, one of the problems is when you do not understand very well how much you can do for a patient, but also the limitations, burnout is a distinct possibility. That you become uh, nihilistic about what you can achieve or that you become uh, excessively ambitious in your willingness to relieve what cannot be relieved. So understanding those limits and being guided appropriately by a nice clinical mentor is a very wise investment of your time. I also believe that the, the world is changing and basically a lot of um, the specialties that are going to be uh, killed by artificial intelligence do not include palliative care. <laughs> and so for you all to think about what the future is, right now there's no doubt the biomedical industrial complex dominates, but artificial intelligence is going to do a lot of harm there, and human contact, personhood contact, is going to be very hot. So I, I think, think about the possibility of taking advantage of becoming uh, part of the new generation of palliative medicine specialists. Great, great ad. Now up front here, please, yes. Hi, uh, my question is for Perry Ann. Um, there's a book, Death Be Not Proud by John Gunther, the death of his 17 year old son. And when you said that we have to listen to 14 year olds, uh, when they claim what they want as far as treatment, what is the, what do, what do we do? I mean, what is the, what do we, how do we follow through on that? So um, I think that one of the hardest parts is, is that time frame, because you know, 14, 17, these are young brains, they're making poor decisions probably all the time. So can they really make a decision about life and death? Do they understand death is really death? Like, you know, we're not gonna come back from it. Uh, so that's when a clinical ethics consult can really come in handy because you can get uh, social workers to talk to the, and child life specialists to talk to the adolescent by themselves. Uh, the parents need to have counseling or talking to people. It's a very long and arduous process. But in the end, um, the parents have the ultimate decision making, but the neurological brain of some kids, not all kids, are capable of understanding life and death, especially if you've been chronically ill. So, you know, you've been through this, you've had a bone marrow transplant, you've had chemo, you've done this. Um, and so evaluating what their opinion is, is important. It is their life and autonomy of people's decision making is valuable all the way down to a two year old when you say, do you want to have peas or carrots? You're giving the kid autonomy. Uh, so forcing somebody, which I've been party to watching doing, forcing a child to go through treatments, forcing a child to do things that they don't want to do is not a great route either. So if a child says, I don't want any more chemo, and you've done all of the routes and you've used all these specialties, then forcing the kid and doing court orders and all those kind of things to make them take a treatment is not the way you would want your child to be treated. And so it comes down to that in the end because that's the other side of the coin. If, if you insist that they have that treatment and you have the legal right to do so, then you're gonna have to force that child. And we all know how fun it is to force a teenager. Imagine that as a treatment. And so it usually comes down to where it gets that ugly and difficult 
and families make the decision to honor the child's wish. Other questions? Yes, right here. Um, the microphone will come to you. Can I stay seated? Yes, you can <laughs> stay seated, yes. Uh, this has been very thought-provoking. Uh, uh, Dr. Barrera, I don't know if I'm pronouncing that correctly. I have ve very mixed feelings as a physician myself about having another physician or team doing what I was taught was part of my job. That is physical, mental, and spiritual care of my patients. So I just wondered if you could comment on that. Sure. Well, medicine is a team sport and it has become a team sport. And I think it's very important that we take advantage of the fact that there's new knowledge on this. There's knowledge about the complexity of suffering. We know how to assess suffering and manage suffering much better than 25 or 30 years ago. And, um, you know, I always use the, the example of, of myself seeing a patient with lung cancer coming to me and say, Dr. Brera, I have a little bit of a, a and I'm seeing the patient for lung cancer and, and some bony meds and doing okay. And I had a patient like that who came, I have a little bit of pain here and, and now it's, it's kind of moving a little bit to the side and I had a little bit of vomiting and a little bit of fever and I touched the tummy and I said, well, Mr. Smith, you know what? I think you have a little bit of a nappy. And uh, uh, basically, I'm your doctor. I'm not going to abandon you. I'm going to book an OR. I'm going to look for a crazy anesthetist to give me anesthesia. And I'm going to do a cephopubic incision on you because I'm not sure I'm going to find the appendix. And I'm going to spend <laughs> four hours in your tummy. And then I'm going to lift something and show it. I say, is this the appendix? Do you guys think? I say, yes, cut it, Eduardo. You've been six hours already. So I'll chop it off. <laughs> and after six units of blood, the person will end up in the ICU for a week and then make it home. Or I can say what I did, that is to phone a wonderful surgeon and say, at MD Anderson and say, hey, listen, I think I have an appy here. Uh, would you mind taking it? Look, yes, of course, Eduardo, send him up. Just, and he phoned me back. for the audience, it's appendicitis, his yeah. appy. Yeah. Just, oh, yes. <laughs> and, and, then, and he said, Send him up, and he said, yeah, it's a bit too late for antibiotics. I think I'm going to do a laparoscopic in 25 minutes. He did that. The next day, the patient was on the way home, and that was it. And what I did tell my patient is, you know, I know something. I, uh, you've got a problem, and I have someone who's wonderful, who can really, really help you. And so I'm going to scale up the care by bringing this person, and this person is going to do a wonderful job, uh, much better than the job I could do right now. So I think we need to take advantage. Because um, in the area of palliative care, uh, we do things that are way more sophisticated than when I studied 30 years ago. In the term of the assessments we do, how we get the conclusion that somebody's paying eight out of eight, eight out of 10, doesn't always mean nociceptive input. There's many other components to it. Managing the problems physically, emotionally, we're doing better than we were doing before. So please do not feel bad. You're taking advantage of another group of people who can do uh, something wonderful for you. And you don't need to uh, say to that patient, I'm not going to see you. You can say, I'm going to send you to Brera. And he's going to help. And then you're going to come and see me. And we're both going to work together. If at some point uh, you don't need to see me, that's, that's wonderful. But otherwise, we'll, we'll see you together. So I think it's a team sport. And this is, this is an aspect of the team that uh, I think many times has been neglected because people sometimes feel that there is that obligation to know all and to do all. And no, not really, not really. Take advantage of people who can pitch in and make sure that in your uh, res repertoire, you have someone who can help you with that. Others, yes. Fran, yes. Please, Fran. Well, I'm going to say something because I always do right. at this, um, at this conversations. Um, I, I'd like to speak to the doctors, the physicians in the group. I have the experience of having an infant who was born terminally ill and died at six months in my arms and making all the ethical decisions with my husband. Um, and I also had the wonderful experience also. I'd have to say my infant was a wonderful experience. But my mother died in April at um, 
one month shy of 101, in my arms. And I think the most important thing, as the expert here, of course, um, is that you as the physician have to know your patient. And you have to trust that if they have a, a designated um, healthcare navigator, their, their family member, that they would know their patient. Because you can't assume that they're gonna die of whatever it is they're gonna die, you think they're gonna die of. Yet you're, you're a hospitalist or whatever, you're coming in, you meet them that day. You don't know them as well as their own physician might know them, or a palliative care physician who's been taking care of them for a long time, or their family member. So you can't say, oh wow, this person's 100 years old. I mean, she, they're gonna die here. They're in the hospital for you know, heart failure. No, they're not all the same. They are completely different. You have to listen to your, the family members who know them best and try to reach out to their physicians who also know them best. And I think um, the difference between uh, the, the ethicists and the palliative care people can help make decisions. I don't think they are the decision makers, but if you have a question, should I feed this baby? Should I not feed this baby? Should I give this baby antibiotics who is really gonna die at some point, but if I give it antibiotics, maybe she gets six more months. I mean, those are questions they can help answer, but don't just assume you know the answer without gathering the group. Thanks. Any, it sounds like sound ethical advice, but any, uh, any reactions or amplifications? Or? I think Fran said it very well yeah. as someone yeah. who's had experience on both ends of the spectrum. And it is a team sport, yeah. family included. Yeah. Well, I'm, uh, I'm, getting the, I'm getting the high. Is there one more, one more question we'll take? Okay, um, maybe the woman in the back there. Uh, to, uh, the one more row back, yes. The, <laughs> Long hair. There, no, no, you're passing her. She's in front of you. There you go. Good. <laughs> I can, I'm sorry. It's hard for me to see with the uh, bright lights. So. That's okay. Please. Um, so you were saying palliative care has come a long way since its conception. Um, and besides the need for hospitals and medical schools to expand the department, what do you think are the biggest things that need to be improved in palliative care? Uh, well, I can answer. I guess on behalf of the people who are, who are trying to do this area and well one of the things we need is to improve the brutal level of ignorance we have. Uh, if you think about the fact that the, we are using the same painkillers uh, for the last 80 to 220 years, those are the main painkillers you will get today if you get cancer, if you get an operation or something like that. And that we're still not sure if water helps, we're still not sure if oxygen helps, we're still not sure if, uh, if food helps. Because we have investing billions of dollars in, in wars on cancer and targeted treatments and new heart pills and new antibiotics and so on. But we have not really invested academically, aggressively on human suffering. And therefore, uh, one of the things that we need to improve is the true uh, knowledge, the, 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 the body of knowledge that exists. And to make an investment on understanding and treating better conditions that are universal to all of us. And I would hope, I mean, my generation did, did what we could and we didn't do very well. So I would hope that your generation will be the one that truly will kick butt over academic and, and medical leaders and, and say, we need more knowledge, we need better medicines, we need better communication techniques. We need to understand the role of the things that we do and that we do to ourselves when we're getting to the end of life. It doesn't cost that much, but it, yes, requires academic investment. <laughs> Thank you. I'm, I, I'm afraid we're um, out of time. I know that there are more questions and all of the speakers have uh, generously offered if you want to ask them privately for a few moments um, after we're uh, done. Uh, you can come up to the uh, stage to uh, uh, ask them uh, those questions. 
Um, um, but as the evening draws to a close, there are um, a few um, special people uh, to thank. Um, um, I want to, um, as the uh, acting director, um, thank the KIE staff, um, from the people who, uh, the, the students who folded the papers, to the people who were running around with uh, uh, microphones, like uh, Lucas and uh, Mike Chitterer, who helped with logistics. Um, Sydney uh, Lucan, um, who um, helped with graphics, design, put together um, the um, uh, uh, posters and the slideshow and um, helped in getting the poetry. Um, very, very special thanks to uh, Laura Bishop, who really coordinated all of uh, the activities. Um, she's the one who basically told me what I had to do, and I just was point and click and did it. Um, and it's really thanks to, uh, thanks to her help. Um, thanks again to all of our uh, speakers. I mean, this was a really uh, rich and I think um, uh, lively and, um, uh, and, and really informative um, um, discussion. Um, thanks to um, uh, Dr. Healton for his uh, introduction. Um, and again to um, Fran and to Tim for your support to make this, um, make this possible. Um, we obviously couldn't do it um, uh, without you. Um, and, and then last, thanks to all of you in the audience for, uh, for coming. I mean, this is really important, right? Um, and uh, we're glad you're here, and we hope that um, you've learned something. Um, but most of all, we hope that you've uh, learned enough to know that you want to learn more. Um, and then we've done our job as, uh, as teachers. So um, thank you. Uh, thank you all for coming. Um, um, thank you, and have a good night. Thank you.